India could split horizontally into two parts as it runs into Eurasia. The movement of the Indian plate that includes most of modern South Asia is causing the Himalayas to grow. This process started around 60 million years ago when the plate first bumped into Eurasia. Scientists from the Netherlands have used the power of an AI simulator to see what this region will look like one day. The computer model showed that the Indian subcontinent will merge with the Horn of Africa in approximately 200 million years. The present-day cities of Mumbai and Mogadishu will become next-door neighbors. They will sit along the newly formed mountain chain scientists provisionally named the Somalaya. On the other side of this geological formation, Madagascar will connect with Sumatra, while Kolkata and the island of Mauritius will occupy the same region. Sri Lanka would cease to exist as it becomes part of the Indian mainland. Further to the north, scientists predict that the Himalayas are going to increase in height in the foreseeable future. As the Indian plate continues to mile northward, there will be major changes to the surrounding landscape. The present fault line will drift further south. Tens of thousands of years in the future, there might be no Nepal. The Himalayan range will have expanded sideways to fully engulf the mountainous country. And there may be way more earthquakes in this part of the world because of this movement. Most researchers agree the speed at which India is moving northward into Eurasia is barely a tenth of an inch every year. Some of them think this is happening because of the plate's buoyancy. It prevents the Indian plate from sinking into the mantle, which gives Tibet its elevated topography. Other scholars believe that the structure is buckling under the pressure. The process resembles what happens to a sheet of paper when you push it horizontally against a wall. As you apply more pressure to its edge, the sheet starts to rise in the middle. In the real world, this bulge would be the Tibetan Plateau. A recent theory gives us the third explanation for the process. Their paper still has to undergo peer review, but the findings are intriguing. The international team of researchers introduced a new concept, the delamination of the Indian plate. This term simply means the separation of layers in a material that is supposed to be bonded together. Think of a sandwich that has cheese and ham slices between two buns. Take one of those layers out of the sandwich and you get delamination. In geological terms, this process involves the upper part of the plate peeling off and moving upwards. In the case of the Indian plate, this is the section that supports Tibet's elevation. The lower section is denser, which causes it to sink into the mantle. Plate tectonics are, in this way, similar to a layered cake. Chefs place the spongy, denser layer at the bottom so the heavier top doesn't crush it. Scientists developed their thesis by analyzing helium gases in water samples from the region's hot springs. Helium-3 is a rare isotope that shows that the mantle is close to the surface of the Earth. Researchers measured helium isotope ratios at 200 Tibetan springs. The pattern they saw shows how close the mantle is to the northern Tibetan surface. Further to the south, they found plenty of helium-4, another isotope, which means that the plate is intact. It forms a barrier that helium-3 cannot penetrate, except in one region near Bhutan, in the eastern part of the Himalayas. The seismic activity in the region is good proof that delamination, the sandwich theory, is all real here. And it shows us that the mantle is intruding from the eastern side of the plateau. This concept puts under question the old, established ideas about tectonic plate behavior. The scientists behind the study suspect that the unique shape of the Indian plate contributes to the delamination process. It's the thickest at the northernmost point and the thinnest on the sides. If it's all true, it will mean that the continental collisions have a more dynamic and complex nature than geologists previously believed. Scientists still don't have enough hard evidence to prove the correctness of the new theory, just hints. Drilling to depths of over 60 miles is mechanically impossible right now. Such excavations are necessary to be 100% sure that the delamination process is going on. With the right technology, we would be able to better understand the hazards associated with earthquakes in the Asia-Pacific region. 
It's home to the famous Ring of Fire, where 75% of Earth's volcanoes are located. Nine out of 10, all earthquakes take place here. The India-Australia Capricorn tectonic plate beneath the Indian Ocean is also important for solving Earth's tectonic mysteries. The term geophysicists use for such locations is nascent plate boundary. These are plates where tectonic plates are just starting to pull apart or push against each other. They represent the initial stage of a full-fledged plate boundary. Such a geological transformation unfolds at a pace of barely 5% of a single inch per year. That's about as long as a strand of spaghetti is wide. This shouldn't worry us too much from today's perspective. The India-Australia Capricorn Plate is destined to split in half over the course of tens of millions of years. Scientists from France studied records of two earthquakes that happened in 2012 and concluded there must be a nascent boundary there. Earthquakes normally occur at places where two or more tectonic plates meet. But the tremors in the Indian Ocean happened in the middle of the plate. The scientists used sonar scanning to map out the seafloor and see what was really going on there. After further examination of the marine area off the coast of Western Australia, researchers found a complex network of 62 pull-apart basins along a fracture zone. The scientific data backed up the idea that the tectonic plate was slowly but surely breaking apart. It's another proof that the outer layer of our planet is dynamic, not static. In some cases, you don't have to be a scientist to notice these powerful underground forces. Massive crevices emerged almost overnight due to heavy rainfall in a seismically active region in rural Kenya, first in 2018 and then again in 2023. The local population named the biggest of them the Grand Kenya. These events were not one-time incidents, but signals from the East African Rift System, part of the Great Rift Valley. This huge geological phenomenon stretching from Jordan to Mozambique shows us the gradual splitting of the African continent into two subcontinents. You can find rift valleys all around the world as proof of how tectonic plate movements are changing the planet. The East African Rift shows the underlying dynamics of the Nubian and Somali plates. The Nubian plate bears most of Africa, and the smaller Somali plate cradles the Horn of Africa. The two are gradually moving away from one another, which causes the formation of crevices within the rift valley. This process of continental rifting, going on at a rate slightly faster than the one in India, will eventually lead to the split of Africa into two continents. The whole process, which is about to happen in the next 10 to 50 million years, marks a significant geological event that reminds us of Earth's historical transformations. The last time our planet's geography changed so drastically was during the Jurassic period. The world map from the period looks recognizable, but the land masses were oddly positioned from the modern perspective. In the north, Eurasia was still loosely connected to North America, which was at the time called Laurasia. This landmass was slowly moving away from the supercontinent of Gondwana, further down south. It consisted of what we know today as Africa, South America, Australia, and Antarctica. At the time, the Indian plate was closer to Madagascar than to Eurasia, as it is today. Imagine there is a huge crevice right under your house. What would you do? Probably pick up your belongings and evacuate the structure. This is what happened to one Kenyan back in 2018. A massive crevice formed almost overnight under his home. The man escaped to safety, but the event revealed a deeper issue, much deeper than most people thought. The crevice appeared after a month of heavy rainfall. This part of the country, west of the Kenyan capital of Nairobi, sits in a seismically active region. The massive hole in the ground was covered with ash from a nearby dormant volcano. The crevice in the ground ran for miles, and it was 65 feet wide in some places. It was as deep as the Hollywood sign is tall. The gaping hole damaged a vital local road. People soon dubbed it the Grand Canyon. But this is no laughing matter. The same thing happened in 2023. 
Kenya's Highway Authority had to close the busy road for repairs once again. Preliminary reports showed that heavy rains were the likeliest cause. The rupture itself is part of the Great Rift Valley. It extends from Jordan in the north to Mozambique in eastern Africa. Its total length is nearly one and a half times the distance from New York to Los Angeles. Rift valleys are located all over the planet. They're lowland places where tectonic plates move apart or rift. These are huge slabs of rock in Earth's outermost layer. They rest on molten rock underneath, which makes them unstable. Tectonic plates are constantly on the move. They can bump into each other or one plate can go under another. This can occur both on land and at the bottom of the ocean. Continental rifts are less frequent than the ones we find underwater. The East African Rift is one of four major ones. The nearby Arabian Plate has been on the move for the last 30 million years. When it separated from the African mainland, it created the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. When you look at the physical map of Africa, it looks like one contiguous landmass. But when you dig deeper, quite literally, you realize it rests on two tectonic plates. The Nubian one carries most of the continent. The smaller Somali plate holds the Horn of Africa. The crevice in Kenya appeared in the rift valley between these two plates. That's because they're moving away from each other. The rift is growing larger, which means that one day the African continent will split into two. The rifting process is a slow one. The present rate is just a quarter of an inch every year. Scientists estimate that the split will occur in 5 to 10 million years. Some experts place this event 50 million years into the future. The end result will be two African subcontinents. They will be separated by a body of water that will become our planet's sixth ocean. This also means that five now landlocked countries will get access to the sea. When they get a coastline, the countries could build harbors to trade with the rest of the world. Three other countries, including Kenya, would find themselves on two continents. The future split of Africa into two parts might sound dramatic at first, but it wouldn't be unnatural. This is the first time, after hundreds of millions of years, that the shape of Earth would change so much. The last time this happened was during the Jurassic period. If you're now thinking of Steven Spielberg's 1993 blockbuster movie, you're right! The world of dinosaurs had a different shape than the one we're familiar with today. There was a supercontinent called Gondwana. It included today's South America, Antarctica, India, Africa, Arabia, Madagascar, and Australia. Then, around 180 million years ago, things started to change. Earth was starting to take its familiar shape. The Indian subcontinent collided with the Asian mainland. The event gave rise to the Himalayan mountain range. These are the highest mountains in the world, with 30 peaks over 24,000 feet in altitude. This process is far from over. The Himalayas are still growing in height. On the other side of Gondwana, Africa and South America first separated together. But they weren't meant to last long. 40 million years later, South America started drifting away from Africa. This created the South Atlantic Ocean. The evidence of this ancient continental drift is obvious to this day. If you look at the map of South America, you'll notice a bulge in its eastern part. That's the modern country of Brazil. On the other side of the Atlantic, Africa has a huge inland curve on its western side. The two act as pieces of a giant jigsaw puzzle. They roughly fit into one another. European scientists noticed this as early as the 17th century. Further research confirmed the theory that South America and Africa once belonged to the same landmass. This is only one part of the story. At the beginning of the 20th century, a German scientist came up with the theory of continental drift. He believed that all of Earth's continents were once part of a supercontinent called Pangaea. The name comes from Greek, and it means all of the Earth. Makes sense, doesn't it? It was surrounded by the oceanic ancestor of the Pacific Ocean. 
Some 200 million years ago, this gigantic landmass was home to many animal and plant species. Thanks to them, scientists could piece together what our planet used to look like. For example, Mesosaurus was a giant freshwater reptile that existed during the Cretaceous period. Paleontologists found its fossils in only two places, Africa and South America. The animal lived in fresh water, so there was no way it could have swam in the Atlantic Ocean. This pointed to the fact that it lived in a single habitat, rich in rivers and lakes. This would have been possible in only one scenario. The two continents that are now miles apart were once a single piece of land. Pangaea wasn't the only supercontinent in Earth's history. Continents came together and drifted apart several times throughout our planet's past. Researchers know of at least three times this happened. Panodia formed 600 million years ago. Rodinia was an even older supercontinent. It existed a billion years ago. The driving force behind all these changes was tectonic activity. Plates deep beneath our feet have the ability to create new land and oceans. This is what's happening in East Africa right now. This activity is most evident at the bottom of the sea. Molten rock rises from deep within the earth to create new seafloor. The process is called seafloor spreading. It happens along underwater mountains called ridges. One example is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. I think you can fairly accurately guess its location. Over time, the seafloor grows wider here. This has an effect on the continents on both sides of the ridge. Seafloor spreading causes continents to move away from each other. Right now, North America is moving away from Europe at a rate of one inch per year. This doesn't seem like much, but give it 50 million years and the Americas are gonna bump into the western part of Asia. The two landmasses will form a new supercontinent. Geologists from Yale University have a name for this land, Amasia. Talk about rushing before the ore. They ran a series of computer simulations to see what Earth would look like millions of years from now. The new continent is likely going to form somewhere around the North Pole. But don't go shopping for winter clothes just yet. The time frame for this event might extend to 200 million years into the future. You plan to spend your summer vacation in Africa. The final destination is the Sahara Desert. It's located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. You're excited to ride camels and learn about the region's rich cultures. You hop on an extensively long flight, and finally, you are here. You find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Can you believe it's 3 million square miles? You're ready for your first adventure after drinking liters of ice-cold water. The guide gives you a choice. You can spend two weeks visiting a collection of oases, or you can help them solve an ongoing local mystery. Deep into the desert, near this Algerian town, lies a mystery begging to be solved. A collection of huge, spotted circles in the sand. There are dozens of them, stretching for miles in a straight line. The circles were first identified via Google Earth images several years ago. People have debated them for years, but no one seems to know the answer. The strange thing is that they are so many miles away from any towns, roads, or human activity. The quickest way to discover the truth behind the circles is asking questions. You grab your notebook and set up to talk to locals. Everyone is helpful in this scenario – geographers, anthropologists, elders, and historians. The first person you talk to is a map expert. You need to understand if those circles were authentic or a satellite glitch. You end up interviewing the people who take Google Earth satellite pictures. The circles are really there. They appear in multiple pictures from many years. Then, let's understand why they are there in the first place. After two days of interviews, you have your first lead. The circles could be the result of oil activity. Experts explained why this would make sense. Algeria is a rich area for natural resources, so this would be a sensible guess. Usually, to find out if there is anything worth extracting, companies would undertake seismic surveys. Seismic surveys are a way of analyzing the Earth's surface by sending shock waves into the ground. 
depending on how these waves bounce back, you'll know what is located there. A special vehicle could have marked the soil that way. So, did we unravel the mystery? Mm, not quite so. As you know, the Sahara Desert is one of the driest areas on the planet. The average high temperatures in summer are over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. To survive there, people need to find ways of accessing water. So, these circles could be a kind of ruin or leftovers from ancient water wells. Again, I'd say this is a sensible guess. Ready for some fact-checking? Some anthropologists agree that these circles could be ancient fogueras. Fogera is the name of a 2,500-year-old style of irrigation system, usually found in northern Africa. It is also known as a kanat in other places in northern Africa. Locals would dig a deep well at an elevated point, deep enough to tap into underground water. They would then dig parallel shafts at regular distances. Then, they would dig an underground channel that connected the city to the well. Solely with the help of gravity, water would run from the well to the city. This traditional technology provided water for crops, livestock, and humans. Now, let's say these wells made human-made oases possible. Even the closest municipality name was an indication that this could be true. The name Fogaret Esaoia is actually named after Fogarets, these ancient wells. Now this lead was proving to be very accurate. You decide to travel over there to see for yourself. You take a local bus, sit back, and enjoy the ride. The landscape in northern Algeria is filled with ancient-looking towns. You even see ruins of wells along the way, on the outskirts of smaller cities. Opening Google satellite images, you can see the Kanat's markings on the ground, a series of holes running down several miles. But as soon as you arrive, you find out you were wrong. Dale Lightfoot, one of the world's leading experts on Kanat's, said that the circles were definitely not Kanat's. Even the satellite images confirm this difference. Uh-oh, we were so close! Apparently, Kanats or Fagras would not run down a straight line. They wouldn't be shaped like circles. Another clue that this wasn't the case was that there were no towns at the end. The circles were really far away from any human activity, and Kanats were explicitly built to provide water for human settlements. Well, it sure was a good try. You almost gave up on this mystery when you decided to take one more field trip. It was days of preparation pick up cars, food, equipment, all so that the mystery of the Sahara circles could be unraveled. On the first day, you drove over 99 miles into the desert. You were always curious to see what this part of the world looked like. Over there, you see nothing but mustard yellow dunes. The night sky is pretty decent, though. You can see the entire Milky Way with your own eyes. You set up camp and sleep under a canopy of stars. The next day, tension grows. There's no cell reception. Oh dear. But thankfully, you added the coordinates of the circles to your Google map. And surprise, the offline mode works out there. You follow the coordinates, but it leads you astray. You start to get nervous, thinking this was all in vain. But you and the team get into the car and drive a few more miles past the coordinates on your phone. After a very bumpy ride, you can't believe your eyes. There it is! An enormous crater dug on the sand, surrounded by 12 smaller holes. From up high, it looks like a clock. Without the pointers, of course. On the ground, they're very faint. So faint, you almost miss them. Searching the area, you notice all the holes had something similar. Metal wires. Thin wires that you can pull from the ground. They're buried deep, so you start digging. An object starts to reveal itself. Uh-oh! It looks like old dynamite. This certainly surprises you. Um, better stop digging to avoid any accidents. At the end of the survey, you feel satisfied, but still curious. What could all this dynamite mean? And who put it there? What comes next is the turning point of your adventure. Walking back to the car, you see something shining on the ground. You approach the item with curiosity. It's round and rusty and looks like a sardine can. What's that doing here? Could this give you more clues about the circle's mystery? Just in case, you pick it up and put it in the car. Back in the city, the puzzle pieces start to reveal the story behind the Sahara circles. 
you bring photos and the sardine can and show them to local experts. They analyze your material and give you an intriguing verdict. As it turns out, guess number one was the closest one to the truth. So, what happened to the first guess? Why do we need to keep digging deeper? Well, because it was only half right. The Sahara circles are not a historical footprint of seismic surveying. Back when the circles were made, this technology didn't even exist. But they sure are related to oil exploration. The dynamite-filled holes were an old method for oil searching. The circles are the leftovers of surveyors looking for resources underground. And the sardine cans? Well, they were left by the workers who held explosion works. You gotta eat, right? According to the model of the can, this happened more or less around the 1950s and 1960s. So these circles aren't even that ancient. More like modern ones, if you ask me. Well, well, well. Hope you are glad you tagged along and helped unravel this mystery. See you in the next mystery-solving adventure. We've all heard of the Sahara. Sure you have. It's the largest hot desert on the planet. A sea of sand covering an area larger than the contiguous United States. But have you ever wondered what lies beneath the sand dunes? To answer this question, we must travel deep into the past of our blue planet. Up until some 6,000 years ago, the Sahara was grassland. Humans were around at this time, not me, spreading agriculture around the planet. In the north of Africa, the color green dominated. Plenty of rainfall meant that there were lakes, rivers, pastures, and even forests. A completely different image of the Sahara from the barren landscape of today. But then, the climate started to shift. The region became parched, and the vegetation started disappearing. The wind did the rest. It took away the fine sediment after there were no plant roots to hold the ground together. Give it a couple thousands of years, and you get a familiar image of the Sahara. Sand and rocks stretching as far as the eye can see. But when it comes to volume, only a quarter of the Sahara is actually sand. The yellow sands of the Sahara are just one part of the story. The desert has many other features, such as gravel plains, salt flats, and plateaus. Makes you think if we understand the word desert correctly. For people who study such terrains, geologists, there is only one condition for defining a desert – precipitation. If an area gets little or no rain, then it's considered a desert. The Sahara certainly fits the bill. Its average annual rainfall is just 3 inches. Compare that to the nearly 45 inches a year in New York. When we look at precipitation, this sandy desert is only the third largest in the world. Number one and two are Antarctica and the Arctic. They are larger than the Sahara by millions of square miles. It sounds odd, but there is more than one type of desert. The first two are polar deserts, while the Sahara is a subtropical desert. But the difference in air temperature are staggering. In Antarctica's interior, temperatures plummet to minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Compare that to the highest temperature on record in the Sahara of 136 degrees Fahrenheit. But this desert has a cool side. At night, the temperature is roughly the same as the average yearly temperature in Denmark. This hot and cold roller coaster makes it hard to choose the right outfit when venturing into the Sahara. And what about the sand? How deep is it actually? The depth varies between 70 and 140 feet. That's not too deep. If you put the Statue of Liberty in a tall dune, half of it would still stick out of the sand. Its vast amounts in the Sahara were created by aeolian processes – that's Greek for wind. Over time, it blows and shapes the surface of the Earth. In dry areas with sparse vegetation, winds erode the ground much faster. That's what happened in North Africa. Under all that sand is the bedrock and cracked clay. If you started digging, you would find the same everywhere on the planet, with one important difference. There is some type of soil covering the bedrock. This is not the case in the Sahara. Because of the arid climate and a lack of vegetation, sand covers the ground below. Over the course of thousands of years, a lot of interesting finds ended up in the desert sand. For example, there are petrified tree trunks. These are essentially preserved prehistoric trees. 
They date back to the time when the region was lush green. In some places, the trees of this fossilized forest are at least 65 feet tall. The wood is so well-preserved that you can still see the texture and knots. There are even fossilized pine cones. In 1992, scientists found glass fragments in eastern Sahara. These canary-yellow glass shards were scattered across hundreds of miles. They didn't belong to an ancient civilization. Although ancient Egyptians used them to make jewelry. In fact, the breastplate of King Tut had a beautiful scarab beetle centerpiece made from this desert glass. For a long time, scientists were puzzled about the true origins of these fragments. They finally concluded that the glass was around 29 million years old. It is an impact tape. If that sounds like it has something to do with the word impact, you are correct. These rocks are formed when a meteorite hits the surface of the Earth. This generates a lot of heat. Scientists estimate that the temperature needed to melt this mineral was close to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Apart from the regular fine-grained sand, we also have melted sand in the Sahara. But the desert conceals other unlikely artifacts. Shark teeth are a common find in Morocco, which sits in the western part of the Sahara. What are the fossilized teeth of these marine predators doing in the middle of the desert? This part of the world looked entirely different millions of years ago. There was a sea cutting right through what is now a desert. The Trans-Saharan Seaway ran the length of present-day Algeria and Mali. It was around 165 feet deep. That was enough for all sorts of aquatic animals to inhabit it. Large catfish, sea snakes, and of course sharks lived in the area. British archaeologists even unearthed a turtle shell in Mali in the 1980s. For centuries, there was even an entire city hidden under the desert. Timgad was a Roman outpost constructed by the Emperor Trajan around the year 100 in the current era. For various reasons, its residents abandoned it around the year 700. The sands of the Sahara soon engulfed the city. It had remained hidden for nearly a thousand years. Then, in the 1700s, a Scottish explorer started digging out the city. His team first uncovered a sandstone triumphal arch 40 feet high, similar to the ones we can see in Rome and Paris today. An amphitheater soon popped out of the sand, and it was followed by well-preserved statues of Roman emperors. The Scotsman's find was so impressive that no one believed him at first. It took two more centuries for archaeologists to fully excavate the city during the 1950s. The site covers a surface as large as 10 polo fields. The ruins reveal the full mastery of Roman city planning. All the streets meet at a right angle, in what is known as an orthogonal grid. You can find the same layout in modern cities such as New York. Historians estimate that during its heyday, 10,000 people called Timgad home. Different nationalities lived here, from Romans to people of African descent. Today, more than 2.5 million people live in and around the Sahara. They are spread across 11 countries in total, and their living space is growing. The desert is 10% larger than it was just a century ago. This process doesn't involve sand pouring out of the Sahara. The ecosystems on the edges of the desert simply change over time. The wind blows the soil away and vegetation dwindles, the perfect conditions for the formation of a desert landscape. These changes are happening in the Sahel, a region south of the Sahara Desert. That's why the African countries have recently come together for a project called the Great Green Wall. The primary goal is to stop the desertification of the Sahel and hold back the sands of the Sahara. Their plan is ambitious and involves planting a wall of trees from the west to the east of the African continent. The proposed forest is not only going to be long, but wide as well. The Sahara and the Sahel share a historic bond. Since antiquity, camel caravans have been making the journey from Africa's Mediterranean coast in the north to the savannas in the south. The golden age of this trade kicked off in the 9th century. The perilous journey took several months to complete. The route was two and a half times longer than the length of the Grand Canyon. Explorers still find evidence of these ancient caravans 
hidden away under the sands of the Sahara. So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's the reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano and its volcanic explosivity index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, the eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the volcanic explosivity index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual. But it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Poland, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew there should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of mini-earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster. Park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, That's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows, and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super eruption would be ash and ash fall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington state in 1980. As for the most recent super eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek eruption. It formed the Yellowstone caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, Let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. 
because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It had been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1,300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal. That's how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. You find yourself in Africa, land of unique wildlife, home to a great variety of cultures and languages, and, first and foremost, 
host to the world's largest hot desert, the Sahara. It's daytime, and you are thirsty for some water and shade. You've been walking for days, trying to find one of those precious-looking oases. You feel you're near, but the horizon just keeps stretching and stretching. Your mind is tired, and your body is feeling all the heat. It's like you've eaten a full plate of hot pepper and then some more, judging by how much you're sweating. And when I say hot, think 100 degrees Fahrenheit hot on average. No wonder this is happening. After all, you find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Now I say hot desert since the biggest deserted landscapes are actually the cold ones, located in Antarctica and the Arctic. I see Antarctica's frozen desert is more or less the size of 1 million LAXs. Yep, the Los Angeles International Airport. The Arctic Desert is just a bit smaller than that. Now, in case you don't know, the Sahara Desert is located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean all the way over to the Red Sea. It occupies an area large enough to place approximately 100,000 Disney World theme parks side by side. According to scientists, its boundaries are expanding. Deserts usually form in the subtropics because of what's called Hadley circulation. The air rises at the equator and descends into the subtropics. This circulation of air has a drying effect, which helps the formation of desert landscapes. Since the 1920s, the Sahara is considered to have expanded by over 10%. How is this happening? Well, let's start from the beginning. You probably know the Sahara Desert as one of the most inhospitable places on Earth today. Just FYI, for a place to be considered a desert, it has to receive less than 4 inches of rain per year. Due to the very small precipitation index, deserts are usually dry and arid places. There is little humidity in the air, and daytime temperatures can go as high as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually, there isn't that much animal and plant life because of the lack of water. But in the Sahara's case, it wasn't always like that. It may be difficult to imagine northern Africa without the tons of sand it has today. But about 20,000 years ago, the Sahara was actually one big oasis. Recent discoveries show clear evidence of what the scientists now call the Green Sahara. In the mid-1800s, a German explorer crossing the Sahara encountered some paintings and engravings that nomad artists had left behind. What he saw in those paintings looked nothing like his actual surroundings. Instead of an arid landscape with only camels and desert vegetation, the rock paintings depicted jungle animals like giraffes and hippos. There were even images of livestock and grazing animals such as cattle and sheep, something that seems impossible for modern-day Sahara. Artists usually draw what they see around them, so this finding really intrigued the German explorer. The drawings were so detailed that the artists must have had close contact with those animals. You can find this rock art spread out in the northern part of the African continent, from Western Sahara to Saudi Arabia. Geologists soon took a keen interest in this and found the first clues to what this could mean. They have been able to confirm that, in fact, northern Africa was once much wetter. They found evidence from nearby deep-sea sediment off the coast of Mauritania. Sampled cores of underwater sand and mud, known as Saharan dust flux, show geologists that, indeed, a green Sahara was possible. The more dust is blowing off of the desert and into the bottom of the ocean, the drier the climate in the region. The sediment cores show that there was much less dust, only half as much, coming off northern Africa during the humid period. This period has to do with Earth's natural cycles. Normally, the Earth rotates at a tilt of 23.5 degrees. But this angle is not consistent and changes over time. Earth's tilt is responsible for the amount of sunlight each hemisphere receives. It affects several ecosystem functions on the planet. During the time of the Green Sahara, the Earth received between 4 and 8% more sunlight than it does today. So when the Earth tilted about 20,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere received more direct sunlight, which affected humidity levels in the region. As the northern hemisphere got warmer, this affected monsoon activity. More specifically, the West African monsoon. Monsoons are wind systems that affect a region's rainfall index and humidity levels. As a part of the globe gets warmer, it allows for more air to rise. It combines with the wind to draw moisture up into the atmosphere. Little by little, northern Africa also became wetter. The increased moisture made the Sahara so wet 
that there were actual bodies of water in the region. As vegetation grew, the plants held on to moisture better than bare sand could. There is evidence of natural basins throughout the Sahara and lakes so big they would fit all of the U.S.'s Great Lakes inside of them. Archaeologists uncovered evidence of vibrant societies in what are now arid areas. It looks like ancient cultures were able to take full advantage of the African humid period. According to researchers, the human population peaked across the Sahara about 9,000 years ago. There are traces of fireplaces, hunting tools, fish hooks, and even mounds of fish bones. Records show that there have been over 230 green periods over the span of 8 million years. Solar radiation is always changing due to natural orbital cycles. That's why Earth will most certainly see another green Sahara moment. It might be thousands of years from now, but it will happen. The same way the Sahara turns green, it turns yellow again. Let's put it like that. All it takes is a significant axial tilt and a few years of readjusting. However, another phenomenon is calling the attention of scientists now. Recent studies by the National Science Foundation from the University of Maryland show the Sahara has expanded 10% over the past 90 years. This phenomenon is called desertification, which literally means fertile land turning into desert land. The Sahara Desert is now advancing into the semi-arid region of Sahel. In 1950, this region was home to 31 million people. Today, its population is over 100 million people. This rapid population growth has largely contributed to the Sahara's expansion. Farmers that were once nomads began settling down. Land usage grew more intense, aiding in weakening the soil. The demand for food has caused an overcropping of the land, so even more of it is turning into the desert now. The study also shows that natural climate cycles can affect rainfall in the Sahara and the Sahel. Scientists affirm that all deserts fluctuate, not only the Sahara. A desert's boundary may expand in the dry winter and contract during the wetter summer. South of the Sahara lies the Chad Basin. It is a natural body of water that now serves as an indicator of the Sahara's expansion. The Chad Basin is located in the region where the Sahara is advancing southward. An atmospheric and ocean expert from the University of Maryland explains that rainfall has reduced greatly in the entire region. Due to reduced rainfalls, there is less water across the entire basin, and even Chad Lake is drying out. Just like the Sahara, the Atacama Desert in Chile, deemed the world's driest, is also expanding. It is located north of the city of Santiago, and its southern border is expanding toward the Chilean capital. Because the climate is getting drier and drier here, the city of Santiago is turning into an arid or semi-arid region itself. The once fertile valleys of local rivers that lived on agriculture and livestock for many generations are losing their revenues as Chilean land is turning into a desert. Since 2010, Santiago has received only a third of its annual rainfall. Outside of the city, farmers are digging holes in search of blue gold, or simply put, water. The situation here is very similar to that of Sahel. So tell me this. Were you as surprised as I was to find out what has been happening in the Sahara region? Feel free to share in the comments below. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system, but the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. 
and they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTem. It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to 1.5 miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as 3 miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway, remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features, like the Old Faithful Geyser or the Grand Prismatic Spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring, fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, these bacteria would create a blue-green hue, thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. It's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. 
but scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes. And the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5-15%. to Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hot spot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. The problem with that asteroid that destroyed dinosaurs was not that it fell, but where it fell. This colossal space rock found the worst place where it could land. Also, the angle at which it hit the ground was the most unfortunate. If it had fallen vertically, there would have been less destruction. But it fell at such an angle that it threw a huge amount of dust into the air. After the disaster occurred, tons of soot started burning. 65 million years ago, only 13% of Earth's surface contained the right amount of sulfur and oil needed to form a colossal amount of soot. If the asteroid had fallen on the other 87% of the territory, dinosaurs could still be living today, but it hit the worst place and lifted a million tons of burning material into the sky. A cloud of incandescent particles covered the sky and set off on a journey across the mainland. Then, these particles settled on the ground and caused large-scale fires. Trees were burning and sending more soot into the sky. But the asteroid collided not only with rocks, it fell on the coast in a place where the seabed was filled with sulfate. As a result of the collision, it started burning, which caused the release of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. The air became poisoned. It seems the dinosaurs didn't stand a chance. And now, let's imagine the asteroid falling in another place, somewhere in the middle of the ocean. Huge waves flooded part of the land, but almost all kinds of dinosaurs survived, or even better. The rock could have fallen somewhere in the desert and left behind a giant crater. That's all. Yes, several dinosaurs passing by wouldn't have survived the collision, but the situation wouldn't have been so critical in general. So, giant lizards remain dominant on our planet. They don't allow other animals to develop since Tyrannosaurus and other ferocious reptiles hunt mammoths and other ancient creatures. The population of mammals is decreasing Velociraptors are fighting for territories with saber-toothed tigers and giant bears. A struggle for survival between dinosaurs and other animals begins. Then, the Ice Age comes, and some reptiles don't survive. Then, new players enter the field. 
Those are humans' early ancestors. Living side by side with dinosaurs is difficult. Lizards attack settlements and caves, so people have to build high walls for protection. By the way, the Tyrannosaurus poses less danger to people than you might have thought. According to the latest research, many creatures were able to run away from this monster. Yes, you probably saw how easily they caught up with cars in the movies, but it wouldn't be as scary in reality. Paleontologists and biologists have analyzed the strength of dino's bones and found out that the creature couldn't reach high speeds. The maximum it was capable of was running twice as slow as a field athlete. Thousands of years have passed. People have learned to live with dinosaurs. They've even managed to tame some lizards. They've domesticated herbivorous dinosaurs to develop agriculture. Triceratopses and bulls now plow fields together. Imagine farms swarming with diplodocuses or brachiosauruses. People climb their long necks and pick fruit from high trees. Stegosauruses protect pastures from wolves and velociraptors. Dinosaurs with shells, such as ankylosauruses, help people across deserts. They, along with camels and donkeys, carry heavy loads. People share the planet with ancient lizards and live in harmony. The situation in the seas and oceans is much worse. Sea reptiles attack wooden ships and catch all the fish. Imagine that you're sailing to another continent with tons of grain, fabrics, fur, and other goods. And then a giant mosasaur appears on the horizon. It's one of the most powerful sea lizards. A great white shark looks like a small fish next to it. The creature could easily defeat a megalodon. And then it comes across a wooden ship. It bites into the deck and pulls the whole boat underwater. Water dinosaurs are the main obstacle to communication between countries. This slows the progress down for a hundred years. People built metal ships to withstand the attacks of the Mosasaur. And finally, they managed to establish sea connections. A similar problem occurs when the first planes take off into the sky. Imagine you're flying on a passenger Boeing. You look out of the window and see a pterodactyl. Ah, wait, it's impossible. These winged lizards aren't so fast but they can catch up with a helicopter or some old biplanes. This poses a serious threat to flights, so people install sound protection systems on board each aircraft. Pterodactyls hear irritating ultrasound from a distance and fly as far away from it as possible. People equip submarines and ships with the same sound shields. Then, after people have learned how to defend themselves from dinosaurs, another problem appears. Lizards are the kings of wildlife, so they displace all other animal species. Dinosaurs run across African savannas, and lizards with fur live in cold winter forests. Lions, wolves, and bears are not the rulers of the wild. Rhinos fight with parasaurolophysis. Stegosauruses attack hippos and take away their territories. Venomous dinosaurs live in jungles. Lizards that can climb trees scare monkeys. Imagine a reptilian ape jumping from one branch to another. To save regular animals from extinction, people have to control the population of predatory reptiles. Huge parks and nature reserves appear in all countries. People transport dinosaurs there and separate them from other wildlife. Dinosaurs seem to be completely under control. When the danger caused by giant reptiles passes, people begin to breed smaller, harmless lizards. Someone buys a chameleon, and someone keeps a microceratus at home. There are dinosaur exhibitions. People take these creatures for a walk as if they were dogs. Some people take selfies with reptiles, go shopping, and sit in cafes with small lizards. Dinosaurs aren't formidable now. They're kind of cute. People ride horses, camels, parasaurolophysis, and pachycephalosauruses. Of course, many have tried to tame velociraptors, but failed. Those are dangerous reptiles and they don't know how to obey. Taming them is almost as difficult as taming an alligator. But dogs and cats are still more popular because they're more intelligent. The brain of a dinosaur is almost as same as that of a chicken. But who knows, if they had lived to this day, perhaps they would have evolved into smarter creatures. Just imagine if dinos were intelligent. In this case, people would have a big problem. Some scientists think that even if a meteorite hadn't destroyed the dinosaurs, they wouldn't have survived to this day. They needed to carry their own colossal weight at all times. It was an enormous load on their bones and joints. 
Most dinosaurs wouldn't have been able to survive the Ice Age with such characteristics, but smaller lizards might have succeeded. Fast and agile dinosaurs, such as Velociraptors and Pachycephalosauruses, would have survived. But in what form? Could dinosaurs have already evolved into something else? Look at the good old chicken. Many scientists believe it's a direct descendant of the formidable Tyrannosaurus. Somewhere deep inside the bird's DNA, there are genes that the dinosaur had. Yep, it's hard to believe, but look at the chicken's body structure and how it walks. Remove the plumage, cover the creature with scales, and give it toothy jaws instead of a beak. And now, you have a mini T-Rex in the coop. And by the way, not only chickens might be the relatives of giant lizards, many birds are dinosaurs' living descendants. Surprisingly, alligators, snakes, crocodiles, and monitor lizards are not as close to ancient reptiles as pelicans, storks, and other flying creatures. Over millions of years of evolution, the paws of dinosaurs turned into wings and toothy elongated jaws ended up as beaks. The genetics of birds is the key to understanding dinosaurs. Pelicans are similar to pterodactyls, ostriches to velociraptors. Perhaps many other animals also share some genes with ancient lizards. If the meteorite hadn't fallen, all dinosaurs would have evolved into completely different, unusual creatures. Scientists want to carefully study the DNA of birds and try to reverse evolution with the help of genetic engineering. They hope to breed dinosaurs out of eggs one day. But to do this, they need to find a specific genome that hasn't changed over tens of millions of years. It hides in the DNA. And it's not so easy to find it and extract it. Do you think we will see powerful reptiles by 2050? About 800,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, a gigantic asteroid soared through space and plummeted toward Earth. It slammed into our planet with enormous force. It blanketed 10% of Earth with shiny black and green lumps of rocky debris, known as tektites. Tektites are pieces of rock that get liquefied by the heat of a meteorite impact. Then they cool down to look like dark, glassy pebbles. A trail of these tektites was strewn across Southeast Asia and reached all the way to eastern Antarctica. This is how scientists know this giant meteorite crash happened. Well, researchers spent nearly a hundred years trying to find the gigantic crater caused by the impact. But tektites were too widespread. That's why they couldn't pinpoint the exact location. Until recently. A team of experts from different universities tried to discover the ground zero of the meteorite impact. They investigated several craters in China and Cambodia, but none seemed to be created by a meteorite crash. The experts then decided to investigate Laos. It's a country where they discovered the largest and most concentrated number of tektites. After ruling out all visible craters, the team came up with a new theory. What if the crater is hidden by something? In search of the potential crater, the scientists measured gravity readings at different locations all across Laos. At the side of an ancient volcanic eruption, below thick, dense layers of cooled volcanic lava, they discovered a severe gravitational anomaly. Ooh. It turned out to be a large, elongated crater, over 300 feet deep and spreading 8 miles wide and 11 miles long. Based on the location and the crater's enormous size, scientists believe this is the impact site of the ancient meteorite. Meanwhile, over 2 billion years ago, long before the age of dinosaurs, Earth was struck by one of the largest asteroids to ever hit our planet. The asteroid was approximately 6 to 9 miles across and created the biggest impact crater on Earth. This is the Vredefort crater. You can find it in present-day South Africa. When it was formed, it had a gigantic diameter of 186 miles. Over the centuries, the massive crater slowly eroded away into the Vredefort Dome. That's a rocky hill formation that was the central side of the asteroid's impact. This formation is so large that it can be seen from space. Today, the Vredefort Dome is a recognized World Heritage Site. It's also home to several towns and communities that encourage tourists to come and visit the ancient crater. In 1943, one pilot strayed from his regular flight path to avoid dangerous weather conditions. Flying over Quebec, Canada, he spotted a large, perfectly circular basin. That is how the Pingualuit crater was discovered. Around 1.4 million years ago, a meteorite hit this spot, creating this small but deep impact crater. It has a diameter of 2 miles and a depth of 1,300 feet. A lake of deep blue water has formed at the bottom of the crater. 
it's said that this lake contains some of the purest water in the world as it has no inlets or outlets. It means that the lake is only filled by rains and melting snow. The lake is home to one species of fish, the Arctic char. The Sudbury Basin is also in Canada. Formed over 1.8 billion years ago, it's one of the largest and oldest impact craters in the world. It's located in Ontario. But the impact from the collision was so powerful that debris from it was found 500 miles away in Minnesota. Unlike most impact craters that have a circular shape, the Sudbury Basin is an oval. It's 39 miles long with a width of 19 miles. The original impact site might have been a whopping 10 miles deep, but its modern-day version is much shallower. The asteroid that created the basin carried a high concentration of natural minerals. This made the soil in the crater incredibly fruitful. Today, its floor is home to numerous fruit and vegetable farms. The unique crater formation of Sudbury Basin was used to train Apollo astronauts before they embarked on their missions to the moon. Perhaps the most famous meteorite of all is the Chicxulub. That's the meteorite responsible for wiping out 75% of all plant and animal life on Earth, including the dinosaurs. The Chicxulub meteorite had a diameter of 6 miles when it struck Earth 66 million years ago. The crater now lies off the coast of Mexico, hidden deep beneath the seabed. It's around 93 miles across and 12 miles in depth. Recently, scientists managed to drill deep down into the highest peak of the impact crater to collect rock samples. They discovered that the disappearance of dinosaurs wasn't caused by the giant size of the meteorite or the scale of the blast. It was because of the exact location where the Chicxulub hit Earth. The meteorite struck part of our planet that was densely filled with a mineral compound called gypsum. It's a soft sulfate mineral that is typically used as a fertilizer. The collision blasted so much sulfur into the air that it blocked out the sun. This caused the prolonged dark winter that doomed the dinosaurs. One of the youngest craters on Earth is the Behringer Crater in Winslow, Arizona. The Behringer Crater is also one of the best-preserved craters on Earth. It was formed 50,000 years ago when a heavy meteorite made mostly of iron plummeted down from space. Earth's atmosphere barely slowed down the massive chunk of metal. It collided with the ground with incredible force. The meteorite vaporized upon impact, leaving very few remains. The crater left by this powerful explosion was named after the man who identified it in 1903. It was a mining engineer named Daniel Behringer. The diameter of the crater is 3,900 feet, and it goes 560 feet deep. The Behringer family still owns the impact site to this day. You can visit the crater and take a guided tour around its rim. The Papagai Crater in Siberia is one of the most interesting craters on Earth. An asteroid impact over 35 million years ago formed this massive basin. The crater is 62 miles across, which makes it the fourth largest one in the world. This crater is unique as it's home to one of the largest diamond deposits in the world. The intense pressure from the collision transformed the graphite at the impact site into diamonds. Scientists say that the crater contains trillions of carats of diamonds, but no one has ever mined them due to the site's remote location and lack of infrastructure. In the year 1530 BCE, a meteoroid entered Earth's atmosphere before shattering into pieces. The meteorite's burning fragments rained down on Earth and crashed into the planet's surface. As a result, a group of craters appeared on a small Estonian island, Sarama. The largest crater is a 360-foot-wide perfect circle. It's 70 feet deep and filled with blue water. Eight smaller craters that appeared during the collision can be found within a half-mile radius of the largest crater. The impact of the meteorite fragments caused the trees on the islands to catch fire almost all forests burned down. Luckily, the woodlands have now grown back and the craters are a popular hiking destination for tourists. A meteorite struck the area we now know as Quebec, Canada around 200 million years ago. This collision created the sixth largest impact crater in the world. It had a diameter of 40 miles. Over the century, the outer rim of the crater has filled up with water. It's now known as Manicougan Reservoir. The impact crater lake is so large it can be seen from space, and its strange shape gave the lake its nickname, the Eye of Quebec. The oldest meteorite crater in the world is in Western Australia. The Yarrabooba crater is 2.2 billion years old. Well, that gets my vote for the best crater name. The impact site is so ancient that the original crater has completely eroded away. 
Yarrabuba's diameter was around 19 to 43 miles. Scientists managed to figure out the age of the impact site by analyzing the ancient crystals and minerals found within the crater. Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened, at least the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies, forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now, there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super-profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys – these are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realize the mantle was very wet, and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. 
There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees, but at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water, which could make a five-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink seawater. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet, which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams live long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks could live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly, but some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet.